1045 session. This is Behind Closed Doors, Managing Passwords in a Dangerous World. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I am a, an active person in the chef community. I enjoy making things, and I generally fight for the user. Let's talk about secrets. There's four types of secrets we're going to use as our guiding use case. Passwords, tokens, keys, and a giant box labeled other. But what defines a secret? Uh, you could treat all private information infrastructure as secret, but it really quickly becomes unwieldy. To keep us focused, we're going to talk about three properties. Uh, first, secrets usually have to be small. Uh, they're going to mostly be up to maybe a few kilobytes at most. You could use a small secret via encryption to control access or unlock much larger amounts of data, but the secret part itself is going to be relatively small. Second, secrets are radioactive. It means that if they were disclosed to an attacker, there would be some kind of negative consequence. And finally, they're required. In almost all situations, they're going to be a required component of whatever the service that needs them, so graceful degradation is a secondary concern, although sometimes still desirable. When we talk about passwords in this talk, I'm specifically talking about machine-to-machine -machine authentication. So this isn't like humans logging into websites. This is a, a server talking to another server. Humans also use passwords for lots of things. We all use them every day. But humans play by different <coughs> rules. Humans, for example, are allowed to know things. Servers don't generally know things. It's either on disk, in RAM, or nowhere. And if it's on disk or in RAM, it can be stolen. Um, humans are allowed to know things that they never tell another human being. Uh, Passwords are generally going to be a short sequence, generally ASCII characters. And for the sake of definition, I will say that a password in our discussion here means something internal or something that was designed with a human in mind. So some examples are SQL database passwords, HTTP proxy passwords, and Linux login passwords. In, po in contrast to passwords, tokens are going to be things built from the ground up to expect server-to-server -server interaction. So something built for a human would generally use a password for authentication, while something built for machine-to-machine -machine authentication from the start is going to use a token. Um, they're also generally not able to be hashed, so they're compared in raw form. So that means that the secrets management system can't cheat a little bit and give you back a password hash. It has to give you back the token in its raw form. Examples include credentials for APIs like uh, OpenStack or PagerDuty or OAuth ref uh, refresh and access tokens. Keys are going to be a lot larger than tokens and passwords, just in terms of file size, and they also usually have important formatting beyond just being a single word. Um, you know, passwords might have space characters in there, but they're going to be some short sequence, whereas, uh, like, say, a TLS key has actual multi line formatting that has to be preserved, or OpenSSL will refuse to load your file. Um, some examples, like I said, TLS keys are also SSH keys. And then finally, there's this long tail of miscellaneous. Sometimes those miscellaneous things look relatively close to one of the other three, things like Kerberos machine tickets, or sometimes they look nothing like it, and you're going to have to look at purpose-built systems. So now that we know what types of secrets we're talking about, we need to take their temperature. Hot secrets are things used during normal operations of the infrastructure. So it means that a service on your infrastructure needs to be able to autonomously access and use this secret without human intervention at runtime. An example is a web application using a database password. The password needs to be available directly to your web application if every time a new web request came in, a human operator had to sit at the, uh, the command line and type in a database password wouldn't work very well. So that password is needed for active operation. This is compared to cold secrets, which are things that need to be kept safe and need to be stored long term, but you don't really need them day to day. So some examples include AWS master passwords or revocation certificates. Um, but it's rarely going to be 100% clear in practice. Most secrets and tools fall somewhere in the middle. For example, a small application cluster might require a human intervention to launch a new service or to launch a new server. But once running, the services have to be autonomous. Like it's a web application process. So you can require human interaction for the beginning, and then you want it to be hot after that. And within online or hot secrets, there's another sort of subspectrum with respect to how often the secret changes. Most traditional online systems are built around slow secrets. Once set, the secret generally only changes if there's a big emergency or to comply with industry standards like PCI DSS. So rotating <laughs> a slow secret is a human-initiated operation and is usually a big deal, uh, something that's not trivial enough you want to do it all that often. The biggest example, TLS keys. So every year or two, TLS certificates have to be rotated because they expire, but day-to-day -day we think of a TLS key and certificate as being sort of static information. We don't worry about it changing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and rotating a key is usually a big deal, often because you've forgotten all of a sudden your website doesn't load properly. 
<laughs> so some newer secrets platforms are bring, uh, bringing in the concept of automatic rotation as a bigger deal. Um, so this means the system will regenerate and redistribute the secrets um, in a span of hours or minutes. So some examples include OCSP stapling for TLS or Amazon's EC2 role credentials, which expire every six hours. So within reason, the more often a secret is rotated, the safer it's going to be. If it's rotating every maybe 60 seconds, you've probably introduced more headache than it's worth. But when you're still talking about minutes to hours, it's going to be a lot safer than days to weeks to months. Um, every time a secret is rotated, if it had leaked in some way or there was a security issue with, say, brute forcing, every time it rotates, all of those previous issues sort of disappear. Um, so it means that, let's say, a thing could be brute forced in a year. That's a realistic threat, but if you're rotating it every, say, four hours, well, we don't really care anymore because by the time you've brute forced it, it's long since no longer important to us. Um, generally, fast rotation does require more coordination between <coughs> the sort of management systems and the consumers of secrets because they have to understand expiration and understand how to refresh their information. Uh, any questions so far? So just to be clear, because it wasn't super obvious from the title, this is talking about server-to-server -server secrets, not like I am building a Django or Rails app and I want to store user passwords, or like using 1Password or LastPass or KeePass. I'm a 1Password user personally, but we're talking about different different sort of use cases of secrets. Just in terms of what you were just saying about every four hours versus every minute, uh, but there are token devices that change every minute. Yep. Can you compare? Those are authentication information and are not really a thing that's ever stored. The actual secret in that case is the serial number of the device, which is baked into the hardware and can never change. So the rotation for one of those is you have to get a new RSA token every three years. So, so there's sort of this, there's there, for, for people that aren't familiar with um, RSA secure IDs or similar sort of the, the Google Authenticator tokens, um, every every 60 seconds or every 120 seconds they give you a new code you type that into a website for login information but the actual secret part of that is a serial number which sort of formed the seed of the the every 60 seconds it generates a new thing by hashing computation um, and that secret for google it never changes for rsa ones you have to get a new physical device for ubks you need a new physical device stuff like that so they, they actually rotate much more slowly than you would think all right so let's talk about the properties of a secret management system. The principle of least access as it pertains to computer science is generally attributed to Jerry Salter in a 1974 uh, ACM paper. It's generally common sense, but it is so often ignored that it bears strenuous repetition. Um, in short, a service or tool should only have access to the secrets it requires and nothing else ever for any reason. The quality of every secrets management system should be judged on two main properties. First, how well can it implement that principle of least privilege or principle of least access? Uh, and second, how much audit information is recorded so that when something goes wrong, and it will, you can sort out exactly what happened. Uh, other features are important. They will make or break your use case for specific tools, but you should always start by checking these two properties. So, so let's do it. Let's manage some secrets. We've all done this. Uh, we all knew it was a bad idea at the time, but maybe not exactly why it was a bad idea. Uh, what we've done breaks both of our guiding principles. With that secret hanging out in plain text in Git, uh, every time a machine clones that Git repository, that secret is hanging out in plain text. That means that anyone that can get access to our code can get access to our secrets. Maybe that's what you wanted, but probably not, because there's a lot more things that need access to the code than that need access to the secrets. For instance, developer laptops, staging environments, things like that. Um, also, at best, we can see maybe who cloned the Git repository from the server logs, but we have no idea who actually accessed the secret because that information is lost in the vast sea of machines that may have access. So we know, or at least have a strong gut feeling, that we want to improve how we distribute and manage this important password. Uh, next, we need to figure out what kinds of threats we want to protect against. Not every secret is going to be equally valuable. Some are more important than others. But whatever systems we pick, we want to make sure that they are at least strong enough for our most valuable secret. Threat modeling is an examination of where attackers are likely to strike and what each new threat brings to the table. So for most of you, there's probably going to be eight-ish major levels of attacks to worry about. Each attack service is an especially vulnerable point in our armor, and we need to plan how to protect against it and also think about if this were breached, what would it mean for our security? 
Also be clear, we're not talking about all the ways to secure a web application. That is a whole different talk. If you have questions, come talk to me later. But we're talking about specifically sort of the infrastructure level management of secrets. Uh, at its heart, a brute force attempt is an attempt to get access to a secret by just making it up. So you don't, you've never been authorized to use the secret, but I can just try all of them until I find it. Um, and you've effectively recreated the secret from thin air. Uh, fortunately, we have several decades of tools and experience to get around this idea. Um, always start with the three R's, rate limit attempts to use a secret, uh, restrict access using firewalls and the like, and rotate secrets very often, as often as possible. Uh, in the context of infrastructure secrets, we're usually looking at internal services, authenticating to other internal services, like a web application to a database. So you can just keep one side of that off the internet entirely. So for instance, web application database, your database probably doesn't need to be on the internet. It should be impossible for the internet to try to brute force access to your MySQL or Postgres server. Um, another option, use technologies that are currently beyond brute forcing, like a 4096-bit RSA key. There is no one on the planet, including the NSA, that we believe has the, the ability to brute force that. It may change in the future, but if you're using it in a way that gets constantly rotated, you could always upgrade to a bigger key size in the future. So for all intents and purposes, a 4096-bit RSA key is currently beyond the scope of brute forcing. The next and generally weakest threat, uh, brute forcing kind of lives in this weird limbo that it could be a big deal, but it's so easy to protect against that we kind of ignore it, is the source code for application leaking. Uh, taking aside the effects to the business, which might be considerable, but that's not my problem because I'm talking about infrastructure operations here. Um, it shouldn't really be a big problem for security if your code leaks. Uh, this can happen fairly often. The most, the most common vector for code leaks is incorrectly configured error pages. Like it starts showing stack traces and things, and people can sort of slowly reconstruct little bits and pieces of how your code work. Um, but in general, I think most developers understand at this point that hard coding secrets into your source code is security via obscurity, <coughs> and that's only a slightly, slightly tiny bit better than no security at all. For our system to be resilient to a code leak, just make sure there's no secrets in the code, which we all generally have a pretty good idea is, is the way we should be doing things already. So the next place that this could be a problem is backup leaks. Superset of a code leak, chances are all of the code files will be included in a backup just because it's easy and we don't really care. Uh, but it's also going to include things like a database backup generally. So any secrets that had only been visible in the database itself, like if you're storing user passwords in, in plain text, for example, um, then they would be able to get access to those. Uh, also a thing to keep in mind when you start talking about data leaks is that we had talked about using uh, anti-brute force protections through things like rate limiting. Once somebody can get the data on their, on their own systems, they can turn off all those protections. So they can brute force as quickly as they want. So if you're relying on rate limiting for things like not being able to brute force logins, a data leak could be significantly more of a problem. Uh, the way to get around backup leaks is either store secrets only in RAM, like things like environment variables, although those are problematic, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, or when you configure your backups, be really explicit to blacklist out the places where your secrets might be. Traversal attacks, there's a lot of very similar attacks that all sort of get lumped under traversal for our purposes. Um, in general, it's the idea of given that the application is supposed to give access to certain data, tricking it into giving you access to other data. So this includes things like a directory traversal or a SQL injection attack. In all cases, the application is only accessing things that it already has access to, so SQL injection. It has access to the database. That's just a thing that your web application has to have access to, but you're going to trick it into giving it access, uh, giving the user access to things that they weren't supposed to have access to themselves. Um, a, a, a common traversal style attack that is also overlooked is uh, Error logging will often include all environment variables. So remember I said environment variables for secrets can be problematic. Uh, when you trigger an exception log, it will usually dump all environment variables into the exception log. That can include things that you thought were only in RAM. Uh, and then if they can attack your error logging system, they could get access to that information potentially. Um, so with this, you're, you're going to have to rely on principle of least access. Any secrets that the the process doesn't have access to, then the attacker via traversal attack can't get access to. Uh, we have a lot of layers of defense, things like file permissions, uh, think chroots, uh, or even Linux containers. Um, in general, you'll want to restrict what the runtime 
of the application can get access to. So uh, the, the most common case of this is, say, TLS keys. They're only readable by the root user. Apache or your web server starts up, it reads the key as root, and then it drops privileges. So no amount of directory traversal attack will give it access to that TLS key because it's lost the ability to do that. Next level up. Uh, once an attacker can run arbitrary code, obviously nothing in your application could protect access at this point because they can just do whatever they want. So we're really falling back on least access as our only protection here. Um, Next up, root access. Uh, when Dante passes through the gates of hell, he notes the inscription, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Uh, this is generally getting pretty close to a, a worst case scenario. The only thing that can keep your secret safe when they have root on a machine is dedicated security hardware. We'll talk a little bit more about those later, but usually most people don't have that. So you should just assume every secret on that box <laughs> is compromised and needs to be rotated. Uh, most people will ignore this attack surface as unlikely, but you should always think about, in case of an emergency, what would I do? Another commonly ignored attack surface is uh, an attacker getting access to a developer workstation. In most small companies, a dev, lop uh, a dev laptop is effectively root on every server, uh, with similar game over level connotations as ro root code execution attacks. Fortunately, or somewhat unfortunately sometimes, laptops are used by humans, so we can rely on techniques like having to log in with a password that activates whole disk encryption. And finally, the higher power attack surface. This is another one that lumps to hold together a whole bunch of weird stuff. Uh, this is where most people draw the line on planning, either voluntarily because they just don't want to deal with it, or because industry regulations don't allow telling the FBI to smeg off. Uh, FISA court warrants, state-sponsored hacker groups, the list goes on, and they get increasingly more difficult to handle. You'll have to ask yourself how far you want to go to protect yourself and your users. Figure it out on your own, but just be aware that this is a thing. What will you do if you get a warrant forcing you to disclose information? Okay, so let's talk about different secret management tools. Starting from the top again, uh, we've got manually moving around text files. Uh, sometimes these will just be files in an application repo, sometimes it'll be its own repo that you clone onto every box, or sometimes you'll just manually copy files around as needed. Uh, that last one is especially common for TLS keys, you'll probably get it from your, your CA and you'll just manually download it onto the boxes that need it. Uh, this is usually fun when expiry rolls around and we've got no idea of how we did it last time and you have to repeat all the work from scratch. Um, You've also only got manual access controls based on where the files physically are located. At best, you've got file permissions on them, but that's about it for least access. Um, least access is really driven by which machines that I remember to copy it to. And we've probably got no audit logging aside from running strace on every machine all the time, which you're not gonna do because it'd be really slow. So being active in the Chef community, usually the next thing I see people try to do is Chef encrypted data bags. Um, if you're not familiar with Chef, don't worry too much, Just I'll, I'll get back to standard systems in a second. Um, people assume it's got the word encrypted in it, it'll keep me safer, I should use it. Um, so encrypted data bags are a shared secret system. That means that every machine that wants to be able to decrypt the value needs the same symmetric key. That key is itself a, secrets ma uh, a secret value, so we haven't really solved secrets management so much as moved down a level of recursion. Um, the, the default management system for those keys is manual file copying, which we saw one slide ago, usually leads to bad things. So we'll see this a whole bunch of times where we don't actually solve secrets management, we just move the problem down to another key and assume that it's fine. Um, Ansible's Vault, similar tool to Chef Encrypted Data Bags, but it takes advantage of Ansible's push-based nature so that the decryption key doesn't need to be present on all of the target machines. The decryption key is only needed on the developer workstations initiating the push. But other than that, it has the same flaws as encrypted data bags. It's a shared secret system, so that means that everything needs the same symmetric key, and we don't really have any way to distribute that other than manually. It's on developer workstations, maybe we'll just put it in one password and not pay attention. Um, also, no audit logging, just like before. And then eYAML is the closest analog to encrypted bags and Ansible Vault in the Puppet world. The key difference is that Puppet does all of the decryption on the Puppet master. So that means that the Puppet Master can see all of your secrets. It's kind of a secret silo, and then we trust it to only hand out access 
to specific secrets to the machines that are supposed to get them. This is called a trusted third party because it has access to everything and then we're relying on its own internal access controls to determine what secrets go where. Uh, this is as opposed to encryption-based systems where anyone with the right decryption key can get access to the stuff. Uh, when you evaluate a TTP system, TTP, trusted third party, gut check your faith in its access controls. Another Chef-specific tool uh, is Chef Vault, no relation to Ansible Vault. This takes uh, advantage of the fact that Chef already uses RSA key pairs for API authentication and uses those to build a key distribution mechanism for the encrypted data bag symmetric keys. The downside is that the Chef key management system is similarly terrible, bespoke, and almost no one pays attention to it. So again, you're really just moving the problem to how do I manage Chef keys instead. All right, an aside, quickly. I mentioned briefly before, there's a difference between a trusted third party system and what I'll call a pre-encryption system. Um, so the former relies on code to control access, but the latter relies on math. Uh, as one might imagine, stuff from rigorously proved mathematical theorems, somewhat stronger than one person's one-off ACL code. Being more generous, most ACL systems in dedicated secrets management tools are gonna be more hardened than just one dude wrote some code five years ago and no one paid any attention, but it's still the difference between math and code, and math is generally going to be stronger. Uh, the downside with the pre-encryption system is that you have to do all the access controls ahead of time because math is math and math is dumb. Math doesn't understand anything about how your infrastructure works. So you have to do all of the work for who can access a secret in, sort of ahead of time before the secrets get used. For a symmetric pre-encryption system, that means that you have to deal with key distribution because key distribution controls who can do the decryption. For asymmetric pre-encryption systems, which uh, we haven't really seen much of, you have to control which asymmetric keys and, and which asymmetric public keys map to being able to access certain secrets. So you can prepare all of the asymmetric encryption ahead of time. In either case, uh, you need sort of low level trusted third party-ish access when you do the work of figuring out which, uh, which other servers are going to have access to a secret. So that means that it's sort of a trusted third party in the front and then in the back we can use a less secure system for distributing and managing the encrypted data. The downside is that uh, the operations of an asymmetric pre-encryption system are going to be pretty incompatible with an auto-scaling or self-healing system because you need that trusted third party there generating new uh, asymmetric encryption stuffs every time a new server, a new identity comes up. Um, so you're not really gonna be able to use that with something like say Amazon auto scaling where it doesn't know anything about that. It just boots a blank machine. You would need something sitting on the side recognizing that there is a new machine and I should authorize it for secrets as opposed to a trusted third party where you can actually talk to it about being a server questions so far before we move into the dedicated tools? Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier Amazon's EC2 uh, role-based uh, keys and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. That coupled with the Amazon KMS service does allow you to... Hold on for like three slides. Okay. Cool. Uh, <laughs> questions? Yes. Yes. Alright, so leaving the realm of single config management tools. New kit on the block is HashiCorp Vault. Again, no relation to Chef Vault or Ansible Vault. They just all use the same names. Relatively new, but already making waves in the secrets world. It's a dedicated secrets management platform, so it supports all the expected features, granular ACLs, high-level audit trails, um, modular storage and authentication backends. Uh, and it's also got the best of breed fast rotation system for secrets. Slightly older is Square's KeyWiz. It's got a little bit more limited data model than HashiCorp Vault um, and a little bit more limited API, <laughs> but that means that it's been tested to a much higher degree because it's sort of there's fewer ways to use it. I'll talk more about KeyWiz FS later, but KeyWiz excels, as you might imagine by the name, at key type secrets. You can use it for things like passwords and tokens, but the integration can be a little bit more complicated. Amazon KMS, like the gentleman mentioned, um, part of the Amazon Web Services Toolkit. It's a little bit different than what we've, what we've seen before. It can best be described as a key escrow system rather than you storing secrets in KMS. You create a hosted key and you send it data to be encrypted and then you can send it data later to be decrypted if you have access to that key. The key itself only ever lives in KMS. You can't get access to it, uh, but you can request encryption and decryption through it. 
That means you still need to manage the storage of the encrypted data. Most people will use S3 for that, but there's other options. We'll talk about a few in a second. Um, the biggest downside to KMS, it requires buying into the AWS ecosystem. So it means you have to be using AWS EC2, AWS IAM, AWS KMS, and then probably AWS S3 or DynamoDB. So unless you're cool with being 100% forever hosted on Amazon, and to be fair, lots of people are. Like that is a completely valid choice. Just be aware when you start using KMS, you are tying yourself to the Amazon ecosystem. Totally fine to do, but be aware of it. So a couple of tools that build on top of KMS <coughs> to give a little bit more of a complete system. Sneaker is one from Code of Hail. It's a command line tool that ties together KMS and S3 into a bit more of a complete secrets management platform. So it handles all of the storage and, and upload and download management for you. Again, tied to the Amazon ecosystem, all the same problems as just using plain KMS. And then from Lyft is a tool called Confidant. Uh, instead of using S3, this uses DynamoDB. It's got a very nice web interface. Um, it's got a bit more of a complete versioning system than Sneaker does, so you can see when secrets have changed and what their prior value was. Um, and it, that's kind of cool because you can audit uh, exactly what triggered uh, secrets changes. But again, KMS, same problems, linked to Amazon forever for always. Trousseau, uh, getting away from, from the KMS land, it's an asymmetric pre-encryption tool built around GPG handling all of the encryption and then pluggable backends for storage. Uh, for storage, it currently supports Amazon S3, raw SCP, so SSH connections, or GitHub GIST for some reason. Um, using GPG for the encryption means that that part of it is relatively bulletproof. We all basically trust GPG encryption at this point. Um, but it also means that if you're not already familiar with GPG, key management may be a bit of a problem. We'll see the same issue with a bunch of other tools that use GPG for encryption. You have to know how to manage GPG key rings and stuff like that. It is totally doable. GPG has some provisions for automated management. Not a ton, but it, you can make it work if you try. SOPS is a tool from Mozilla. Um, combines the properties of the last few tools all together into one Frankenbeast. Um, it can be used with either KMS or GPG, or both at the same time if you have to work on infrastructures that are both Amazon and externally hosted. It doesn't handle storage management, so you'll have to deal with storing the files to S3 or some other file serving mechanism. Um, but it does allow you to do this sort of hybrid between the online KMS usage and the, the pre-encryption GPG usage. Uh, Red October from Cloudflare, very, very different beast. Uh, basically everything that we've looked at so far is designed for hot secrets, so stuff that's going to be accessed online, or at least sort of tepid, neutral-ish secrets. Red October is built from the ground up for cold storage. <coughs> so it uses an N of M key split algorithm, similar to the idea of when you're launching a nuclear missile, you need two keys, so you need at least two people to coordinate. Same general idea, that you can have a secret marked that of the five people that have decryption access, at least two or at least three of them need to coordinate in order to unlock this. So you can use that for very, very high value things, like I mentioned before, Amazon master passwords. If somebody got access to that, they could do all kinds of really terrible things to your Amazon account, but you still need to store it in case someone needs it someday. So make sure that, say, no one rogue employee can take down your system. They need You need two or three people to, to collaborate to do this. You can still use Red October for hot secret access by just saying the N of M is one of one, but that kind of defeats the point. Presented for completeness, Barbican was going to be the OpenStack equivalent to Amazon KMS, but it's dead, sorry. I mentioned Conjure specifically because I see it a lot, but I'm also talking about all other closed source proprietary secrets management platforms. KMS is itself proprietary, but it's trusted by virtue of you don't really have a lot of choice if you want the thing that is baked into the Amazon ecosystem. Unless you are using a system like that where you have to sort of use this because it's part of the, the platform that you're using, I'd be very careful around closed source secrets management tools. I'm at a Linux conference, so I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, always be sure that you can actually verify a vendor's claims when they tell you how secure something is. It's really easy to get this stuff wrong. Uh, people way smarter than me continue to get it wrong all the time, uh, and therefore I have no chance. So I really, really don't want to just take someone's word for it when they say, trust us. And finally, the biggest gun, hardware security modules. Again, mentioning this mostly for completeness, there are bits of hardware that you plug into the server physically that you can hold a secret in it 
that cannot be accessed any way short of physically deconstructing and examining the chip with an electron microscope, <laughs> if done properly. They're very expensive, generally in the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollar range. And remember, you'll need a couple of them for disaster purposes. Uh, so if you really need to go that secure, go for it. But most people probably don't have to do that. Uh, and bugs in them are not unheard of. There's a huge variety of HSM vendors. Some are more trustworthy than others. A fair number of them have had just outright firmware flaws that allow extracting secrets, which defeats the whole point. All right, and through all of this, we keep dancing around the really, really hard problem of secrets management. Uh, deep down, any secrets management system needs to establish an identity relationship between whoever is requesting secrets and whoever is managing them. The person managing them, or the, the thing managing them, hopefully it's not a person, has to be able to make uh, assertions about the identity of whoever is requesting them in a strong fashion. And doing that on any kind of shifting internet is really, really, really hard. Usually you end up with a bootstrap that boils down to whoever answers the SSH at IP 1.2.3.4, well, I just trust that they are who I think they are. And from that point, we can bootstrap a much better system. But that sort of initial trust relationship is usually established via, eh, it's good enough for now. And then on top of that, we build nice, happy, fancy castles in the sky. Some clouds have better server identity mechanisms. So Amazon and Google Cloud both have low-level APIs that you can sort of prove who a server is for reals, um, as long as you trust that the cloud platform itself hasn't been hacked. But that's probably outside of anyone's uh, security planning bounds. But if you either own your own hardware or are running on any of the other clouds that doesn't support this, like OpenStack and Azure, both don't have systems for this, then eh, you probably just use SSH and hope that the initial file copy is secure. As a corollary to this, uh, so you have to build this strong identity concept within your system in order to do good secrets management. In a lot of services, once you've done that, you can skip having secrets at all. So uh, Postgres and MySQL are the two that I, I do this with most often. They support TLS client certificates for authentication. That means that you don't actually need a password. Once you've established identity, you could use that to manage things like TLS signing and just use the identity itself as the authentication information and skip this sort of shared secret password thing that we have to distribute and that's super radioactive. Public keys are by definition public and you have to make sure that you handle them properly, but they're not radioactive in the same way that a password is. Uh, slide. Any questions so far before we jump into integrations? Yes. Uh, what about TPMs? Uh, the question is, what about TPMs? They're like hardware security modules, except much, much worse. And they're usually only in laptops. Not a lot of servers <laughs> ship with TPMs that have Linux drivers. I have a server with one. Should I use it or not use it? Uh, I mean, so a TPM is usually also much more restricted. It's for things like securing boot up information. You can't always just so, so like a laptop TPM, you can write arbitrary data into it. Uh, a server TPM, you can see if there's driver support. If there is, decide if you trust it, but it's going to be sort of the same problem as everything else. How do you get the data to write into it? Any other questions on tools? All right, so let's talk about integrations. How do we actually use all those fancy tools with our applications? Presumably a lot of people here are writing things like web applications in Python or in Rails or in Node or whatever else you're doing. So. A lot of the tools that are services have their own APIs. So things like uh, Vault has HVAC in Python or Vault Rails in Ruby, um, or KMS, Bodocore, or the AWS <laughs> SDK gems. So you can just read and write to and from those APIs from, yes? Just to clarify, which vault are you talking about? Uh, HashiCorp? HashiCorp Vault, yes. The other two aren't services, so they don't, like, Chef Vault is just a file format. It doesn't have an API itself. Um, but HashCorp Vault is a real service. It's got a REST API. So from your, say, Rails app, you could pull data directly from it. So the integration layer can be sort of directly in your application code. Uh, and some, like Vault Rails, even come with web framework integration if you want it. Config management is a sort of another very broad tier where you can do this integration. So a lot of web apps and things like that have config files. You could have your config management tool read from secrets management and write into a config file for an application. So for stuff like Apache or Postgres, where you aren't going to want to go hack 
HashiCorp vault support into Apache because that would take days or months or weeks and you just have no interest, you can have CM sort of act as a shim between them. Um, for Puppet and specifically, there's Hira Vault, which allows doing that sort of deeply in the Puppet Master layer. Um, or most of the other tools have a Ruby or Python API that you could call from Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, whatever it is. Uh, or failing that, you just run whatever the low-level command for things like SOPs or Trousseau um, and script them that way. Relatively unique feature of KeyWiz is that it ships with a Fuse file system driver, um, so it allows direct access to the secrets. Um, this allows referencing KeywizFS paths directly for things like a TLS config in Apache or in Postgres or something like that. So you don't have to modify the service using the secret at all. Uh, you just point it at this magical Fuse file system and it gets everything straight from RAM. Um, originally designed for dynamic configuration services through HashiCorp console, uh, console templates also supports reading data from Vault because HashiCorp likes to integrate all of their tools together. So this is similar to Puppet Salt uh, Ansible, etc., um, except much more restricted. It really only does take data and put it into a template. So you're using the same style of integration as you would with config management, writing into files, um, except that it can do it much faster because it's more limited to just doing this one thing. Um, and this is really important when you're using HashiCorp Vault automatic rotation because you may be rotating your secrets more often than you're running your config management system. So you want that to be picked up immediately. Um, and, and console template immediately within a couple milliseconds, we'll call it immediately. Um, and similarly, env console, so whereas console templates supports writing stuff out to files, env console stores secrets in environment variables and then runs a subprocess and automatically handles restarting the subprocess when the secrets or, or config values change. We did mention that storing <coughs> secrets in environment variables, you should be very careful that they can't accidentally get logged places, but if you do that, env console can be cool to have. And finally, summon is very similar to env console. It runs a subprocess with stuff exposed in environment variables, but it's got a, a pluggable secret provider. Um, it's from the Conjure team, but unlike Conjure, it is actually open source, so I trust it significantly more. Uh, and it's only got providers for pulling files from S3, reading from the Conjure commercial system, or for some reason, local key rings. So it's a bit limited, but you could write new providers if you wanted to. And, uh, and that's what I have. <coughs> Any questions? Yes. So, um, pra practically speaking, you know, over the past five years, several global companies, especially retail companies, mm -hmm. have been hacked or cracked on mm -hmm. how we want to turn that. Um, I've been kind of reading up on the Home Depot 2014 thing, comparable to the Target mm -hmm. thing. Their, their main problem was that they got hacked through a third party vendor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I guess, and it's common news is that the Home Depot CEO was getting ready to go off to the golf course before the bank called him on the phone to tell him what was going on. Mm -hmm. his, his IT people didn't even recognize that there was a problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess, I guess the question is, is that, you know, as far as careers go, in this in this arena, is it still kind of a wide open area? I mean, how much can we trust the third party people? You mentioned the trust factor. Mm -hmm. you know, so we know we know the tools, but mm -hmm. are there people actually using the tools, or are they just deploying a piece of software like Norton or whatever to try to hopefully encrypt some of this stuff? So, so to summarize the question, uh, how much can we trust? the people actually using these tools to be doing it correctly, I think is, is basically your question. Yeah, pretty much. Well, Home Depot's issue was that they were, they were hacked through a third party vendor who got was it, of the... Was it Home Depot or Target that it was like their, their heating... Was the yeah, it was their heating system. Yeah. Had a, yeah, and a lot of that goes back to principle of least privilege that, yeah. for instance, your heating system should not have <laughs> access to the point of sale terminals because <laughs> that... <laughs> That is not a required privilege to control the thermostat. Um, so, you know, if you if you follow the, that principle and you audit it regularly and look at what what privileges does everything in my system have, and I mean everything, so they probably got overlooked because they were a third party vendor. You know, the IT department wasn't really paying attention because it's not our problem, but everything is your problem. Uh, who owns your availability? You do. <laughs> yes. Do you have any thoughts on security? 
securing backups with unknown contents? Uh, so the question is uh, securing backups with unknown contents. Um, you mean like it's an opaque system from some commercial application, you don't know what's in it? Uh, I mean, treat it like you would any other customer data. So, you know, most customer data should be encrypted at rest by most industry standards. Encrypt those at rest and make sure the passwords are rotated regularly, stuff like that. Yes. Out of all those things and tools you've talked about, what do you use? Uh, uh, HashCorp <laughs> Vault, so the question is what, out of everything I mentioned, what do I use? HashCorp Vault is probably best of breed right now. Um, HashCorp Vault plus Chef plus Console Templates gets my vote, but it requires a lot of duct tape and bailing wire still. So if you're looking for easy, um, probably use one of the Amazon hosted tools, um, Amazon KMS, because it's sort of tied into their system. They So Amazon really knows who a VM is. So the identity relationship is baked in at their level and they can make strong assertions about it. When you want to make strong assertions outside of Amazon, it's a little harder, but between the EC2 VM and KMS, the identity management is handled for you. So that's going to be a little bit easier to deal with. There is a uh, TAS offering now from HashiCorp Enterprise Vault that they just announced I think a week or two ago. Uh, if you want to go that route. Sure. I don't know why hosted security is a thing that sounds good to anybody, but. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to do People don't understand layered defense. Um, you know. uh, the, the, for the recording, the uh, audience member mentioned that HashiCorp is now offering a hosted vault option for some reason. Uh, sorry. You, you keep asking a question. Oh, yeah. So MariaDB has, since October, had a, a at rest encryption mm -hmm. capability. Okay. And they have a couple of ways for the key manager to either um, utilize their tool or they uh, have a partner, a German company that mm -hmm. carries. And um, they basically manage the key. Um, do you have any knowledge of that? Do you have anything you've ever? Uh, not really. So the question is, uh, do I have any opinions on the new MariaDB at rest encryption? Not specifically, but most of them, the key is going to be some kind of file that you have to put on the machine before MariaDB boots. Um, it's basically the same pattern as you would use with something like LMCrypt, which you can do at risk uh, encryption for anything, because it's sort of at the Linux device mapper layer. Um, LMCrypt, DMCrypt, DMCrypt, that sounds right. Um, and uh, so you just sort of need to make sure that, that file gets put in place at the right point in the boot cycle. Um, and how you do that, you manage it like any other secret we would in the infrastructure, and it's sort of that secret gets magnified by the size of the encryption volume, but the secret itself is still sort of the same deal. Any other questions? Cool, well thank you very much for coming.